like? Just take us through, you know, from kind of early 74 when you started to put together Shine On and then what, what was happening in your head and what you saw happening in the group. Well, cut to me listening to that saying, I've no fucking idea, I can't remember. I can't remember, you know, this is me talking in 1975. I couldn't remember what happened in 1974. So the idea that I can now remember is sort of nonsensical, further to what I was saying about memory. However, if, if you want um, what I think my memory is, <laughs> or might be, I can't, I mean, I, mean, I could give you that. But if I was writing this down, like in a journal now, I'd go, immediately I'd go, one afternoon at dinner time, I was sitting in the canteen at EMI with the band and a few other people. I can't remember exactly who there was. And quite suddenly, the scene looked like scenes look if you're looking the wrong way through a pair of binoculars or through one lens of a binoculars. Everything was receding. There is no pain. You are receding. I mean, that's where the, this is maybe where that line came from later on, cropped up later. And I thought, fuck me. This is what it must be like to have a nervous breakdown. This is what it must be like to be Sid. This is what it must be like to go crazy. This is the, because I'm used to people sitting at a table being there and they don't suddenly get smaller and distant. And I can't remember what the audio sensation was, but I suspect it, it, it feels as if it should have been a sort of white noise or something. So you get this... And everybody's... Go and I thought, no, this is all wrong. So, uh, and I stood up and I went upstairs to number three. And this must have been during the making of Wish You Were Here. And uh, I sat down and I started playing the piano. And if, after a few minutes, everything came back into where it was. And I've never experienced anything like that again. You know, um, the closest I come is occasionally um, you know, I'll put the remains of the scrambled eggs in the dishwasher and throw the plate in the garbage can. But that's as close as I get. The weird, weirdest that is. Yeah. Except having to, you know, expl explain that to people occasionally. A lot of people get have those experiences sometimes. <laughs> you throw your socks away and put them, whatever. Anyway, um, so... But what was going on at the table, and I only have the very, very, very kind of vaguest memory. I, I do have some vague memories of, um, you know, of the conversations about what should be on the record and it shouldn't have raving and drooling or whatever, or sheep or whatever sheep was called in those days. And it should be about absence and it should be thematic and it should be this and it should be that and the other. Um, but the minutiae, uh, I would not be a good witness. The shape of the album, the, the concept of it was, am I right, was yours, right? And that was to do with absence in the sense of this was going to be the plan. An album used to be like a photo album. It was just a collection of songs. They didn't have to have any connection one with another. That's why they were called albums, because they were just like books of photographs, really. Whereas what we had started to work on, and well, we, with Dark Side of the Moon, we'd arrived at that thing of, no, it's not an album, although we still call them albums. It's a, you know, it's a coherent, cohesive piece of work with a beginning and a middle and an end. And it's, it's more like a play or, or a film than it is like what we used to call albums. Frank Chuckersfield, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> And there's a bunch of songs, different songs, and they have nothing to do one with the other. No, we, these songs do have to do one with the other. And in the case of Wish You Were Here, they're all about absence in one way or another. So that's the central theme, which is why the title works well. Everything about it is kind of is, is coherent. Do you, do you think because the song bookends the album, 
that it's kind of unbalanced in a way. Well, it doesn't. The song doesn't bookend the album. The Pete, what happened is I wrote a song and the title of that song was then taken as a title for parts one to seven or whatever it is. But the thing that starts with Dave's riff, you know, ba da da da, and all, all of that, and all that beautiful stuff, which I think is really beautiful, and, and Rick, you know, was super important in chord sequence and stuff, and then the more rhythmic stuff at the end, you know, after the Sandman bit and the bits that come out, they're nothing to do with Sid. That's, a, that's an abstract instrumental piece. One of the bits of what is called Shine On You Crazy Diamond Parts 1 to 6 happens to be a song that I wrote about Sid, but the rest of it's nothing to do with Sid. People have made that connection, or maybe you've made that connection, because it is melancholic, and one of the parts is about Sid. After Sid went crazy, the struggle that we, that the four of us went through, uh, from 1968 all, all the way th or through till Dark Side of the Moon, if you like. Um, uh, at least it's an important part of the story as that one album that we made, you know, with Sid. You could say that, they, um, that Piper at the Gates of Dawn um, in a way is less about a group. So if you like, the bookends of the bit of Pink Floyd that I was involved with are Piper at the Gates of Dawn and The Final Cut, and one was mine and one was Sid's. And in between, there's all this stuff that, you know, that we all sort of have heard the stories and, and know about. Off the back of um, the success of Dark Side of the Moon, we were very fragmented and um, and to some large extent remained so for the rest of our time together. Um, and that's not to say we didn't do some terrific work together, and we were, which we did. You know, I love all the, all the rest of the stuff that we did together. I think it, it, I think it's good in one way or another. Um, when you listen to the beginning of the song, Wish You Were Here. So, so you think you can tell heaven from hell, blue skies from pain, can you tell a green field? And uh, no, all of that. From a cold steel rail, a smile from a veil. That first verse, or that, those first three couplets, are asking a fundamental question, and that question is, exactly as it's expressed in the thing. It's more of a statement, actually. It's saying, I believe it is fundamentally important to your experience of being human that you find yourself able to cast off the carapace of faith or dogma or indoctrination or whatever got handed down to you by your parents or... or the priest or the government or you know reaganism or whatever it might be all those fundamental um ideological um uh contrivances that are barriers between us and the reality of our lives um you know i've this tour i've been doing of the wall we have um um this project that we set up through the Facebook page where we honour um, fallen loved ones, we honour people's, people send in pictures of loved ones who've been lost either in wars or in conflicts with a little story uh, about them or and what happened to them. And without judging any of it in any way, we just put the picture up on the wall either during the show or in, or in the intermission with the story of who this person was and what happens and allow them to speak for themselves. And it's the act of the people sending in the pictures. And often of a grandparent or somebody they never met or so, you know, um, it's, that's important. It's the act of engaging in community that's important. The act is almost a walk on part in the wall. The act of engagement is, is, is the really, really important thing. Um, and it's the act of engagement that gives us um, pleasure.
in the end, or, or fulfillment, or a sense of something. You know, I've just got involved in a. A woman wrote to me, and uh, it's an it's a, a charity organisation, and it's called uh, One Small Home or House, one or the other, O S H anyway, and uh, it, it it they work out of um, NYU particular group of people and what they do is they raise a little bit of cash from donations from somebody or other and then they they go to very poor parts of Mexico which is where they've been doing their work and they build one room houses for people who don't have houses and so if you can it almost you know it almost makes me tear up to think about being one of those people who you, you get on a plane you fly jet blue to you know to um uh, somewhere in mexico and and you know and you get out your hammer and somebody has paid for the wood and the tarpaulin and you build a house for somebody and then they move in Ooh, you know yeah, it's a very small thing, but it's a huge gift to the people who actually, the people who've noticed the difference between a smile and a veil and who actually fly down there and do it and do it and get their hands dirty and do it. Get the greatest gift that anybody could possibly get, which is the gift of helping somebody else. Um, obviously, the people who are having a house built for them get a gift as well, but it's nothing like the gift that the people who are doing the work get from their attachment to the idea that this is a good thing to do and that that and that they are determined to um, um, accept and experience their particular walk on part in the war against um, inhumanity it's interesting um, to talk to talk a little bit about what doesn't a band need a kind of the man with the plan I mean isn't isn't that always the case, really? Um, I, d I can't speak for bands in general. Um, I think it's good if you've got somebody who has uh, ideas and knows what they want to do, because otherwise there can be a lot of sitting around in, in bands going, well, what should we do now? <laughs> So it's very useful. You need two things in a band. I think you need that bloke and you need songwriter. And the other things like the singing and playing the guitar and things, there's lots of those people. The, trick, the, the difficult people to find are the songwriters and maybe even the man with the plan, as you say, you know, somebody who's got ideas, something they want to... But it may be that the wanting to express something also has something to do with somebody who wants to write songs because they've got ideas about things, you know, and they have feelings about things that they want to express. May, but m bands live or die by songwriting, really. <laughs> anyway. There's a lot of, uh, I wish you were here, the, the kind of music variations in there, aren't there? I mean, there are. How does it go? It's a very funky kind of. Yeah. Very different from yeah. sort of... You shouldn't really be talking to me about that. You should be talking to somebody who cares, you know, <laughs> about that. I don't really care about that. I care about all the stuff I'm have, uh, that I'm, you know, I've been talking to you about that. I care about the people, I care about the band, I care about the songs and what they're about. And I care about, you know, politics and all of that. I care about literature. I care about soccer, obviously. Not that much at the moment, because I'm a Gunners fan, and we're going through a very, very difficult time. <laughs> but luckily it's only a game. <laughs>